Welcome to Professor Ortlieb's Blue Book Podcast, a series of podcasts designed to teach 1L students the basics of legal citation using the Blue Book. In the last episode, we learned how to form and abbreviate more case names using Blue Book Rule 10.2.1a, b, e, and f. In this episode, we will complete our examination of the rules governing case name abbreviations under 10.2.1g. This episode will also review Blue Book's general style rules on abbreviations, numerals, and symbols under Blue Book Rule 6. We'll also take a look at italicization under Rule 7. You'll want to have a copy of your Blue Book in front of you as you watch this podcast. Rule 10.2.1g tells us how to use surnames in forming case names. When forming a case name for a case between two individuals, you should omit given or first names and initials of the individuals. In the case of Susan Smith versus Bob Jones, the case name would simply be Smith v. Jones. But this surname rule doesn't apply where a business firm is using an individual's full name in its title. In the case of Susan Smith versus Bob Jones University, you would write Smith v. Bob Jones University as your case name. If in a citation sentence, remember that a university would be further abbreviated to UNIV period under T6. Next, don't leave off any part of a surname that is made up of more than one word. Names like Debra, Van de Kamp, or Abdul Jabbar actually contain multiple pieces of the surname, and you'll retain all pieces of the surname. If a person's name is entirely in a language from a culture that gives the surname first, such as a Chinese culture, Vietnamese culture, and Korean culture, retain the full name. So in the case of Fa Mulan versus Timothy Ho, it becomes Fa Mulan v. Ho. Note, I did not retain the Timothy because Timothy is not in the same language as Ho. Finally, Include all surnames after the first surname listed for the first party, even when the names are not hyphenated. So, in the case of D. Jean Ortega Perón versus Elizabeth Shea Halpern, you would write Ortega Perón v. Shea Halpern. Note, I kept Ortega even though the name didn't have a hyphen, but I did include the hyphen already in the Shea Halpern last name. If you're ever in doubt about which portions of the name to keep, Look up the case name in the case name index for the reporter where you found your case. You can find the case name index at the front or back of any reporter. Next, let's take a look at Blue Book Rule 6, which provides guidance on formatting abbreviations, numerals, and symbols. The Blue Book contains sp specific abbreviations you should be using in your sites in tables T6 through T16. If the abbreviation you want to use isn't listed in one of those tables, you probably shouldn't be using it. Remember that these abbreviations are for your sites only. Don't attempt to abbreviate your main text the same way you abbreviate your sites. Also, remember that abbreviations are context specific. For example, in T7 on page 499, you might see this entry around district. Notice that the abbreviation for district can be D or DIST period, depending on what type of district you're abbreviating. Be sure you're using the appropriate abbreviation for your context. Many who are new to the Blue Book have a hard time deciding where to place spaces in sites. Spacing isn't always apparent from the examples given in the Blue Book because of the proportional print. Rule 6.1a provides the general rules regarding spacing so that you need not rely on the Blue Book's examples for identifying where to place your spaces. First, make sure you close up all adjacent single capitals, but provide space before and after abbreviations of two or more letters. Though numbers and ordinals may be made of two or more characters, they should still be treated as one capital letter. Finally, close up initials used in names. Rule 6.1b tells you where to place periods when using abbreviations. First, 
use a period at the end of any abbreviation unless the last letter of the abbreviation is set off by an apostrophe. Therefore, the abbreviations for avenue and building would end in a period, but the abbreviations for association and department would not. If in doubt about whether your abbreviation requires a period at the end, consult the table where you found the abbreviation. All four examples listed here were pulled from table T6 starting on page 496. When an entity is known by its initials, you can leave out the periods. For example, the FBI is known by its acronym. Therefore, we can omit the periods when we write the acronym. But you should retain the periods in US and retain the periods for any other abbreviations of an entity that does not go by its initials. For example, New Jersey is abbreviated N period J period, but is not known as NJ. You would retain the periods in such an abbreviation. The same could be said for New York and South Dakota listed here. Rule 6.2 clarifies when you should spell out numbers and when you should use numerals. You should spell out numbers in a textual sentence when the number is under 100. You should also spell out numbers that begin a sentence. You may spell out round numbers such as 100 or 1000 as long as you're spelling such terms consistently. On the other hand, you should use numerals when listing a mix of numbers above and below 100. Also use numerals where the number you're writing contains a decimal point, percent symbol, or dollar sign. Similarly, use numerals for sections, volumes, and subdivisions. Finally, use numerals, not ordinals, when writing dates. So when should you use ordinals, and how should you format them? First, we're going to use numerals in, in our ordinals in sites. This rule is already familiar to you as you've used ordinals to indicate the second or third series in your reporter abbreviations. Similarly, you've abbreviated the federal circuits by their ordinals in your sites. In textual sentences, you should use numerals when indicating ordinals over the tenth. Therefore, you would spell out ninth as a word, but use the number 11 followed by the th to indicate the eleventh. When you do use numerals in your ordinals, don't use superscripts. Many word processors will autocorrect and place your ordinal designation in small print above the line. That's called a superscript. You'll want to disable that autocorrect feature when working on your blue booking, or you'll have your blue booking marked wrong. Next, when using an ordinal that has an RD or ND ordinal designation, such as third or second, you will include the N or R in a textual sentence. But when that third or second is in a site, we're going to cut the N or R. For example, if you were writing about the 102nd Congress in a sentence, you would include the N in the ordinal designation. But if you're referring to a second edition, second series, or third circuit, you eliminate the N or R and retain the D alone in this bottom example. Rule 6.2 also clarifies when to use symbols and when to write out words such as section or paragraph. In general, use the word section or paragraph in a textual sentence unless you're referring to the U.S. Code or a federal regulation. Look at this example. In your sentence, you're referring to section 27 of a state code. Which sentence would be correct? The sentence that uses the word section or the sentence that uses the symbol section? The answer is the first sentence. Since the sentence is not referring to a section of the U.S. Code, you would need to write out the word section. What about in the second example? You want to refer to Title 42, Section 1983 of the United States Code in your sentence. How would you do that? The answer is the second sentence. When referring to the U.S. Code, you would place the title number first, then U.S.C., all closed up with periods, the section symbol, and end with the section number. Note that there is a space before and after the section symbol. When referring to paragraphs or sections in a site, you should use the symbols. As you saw in the text example in the last slide, Place a space before and after the symbol. 
When referring to dollar amounts or percentages using numerals, you should use the symbols. If you spelled out the numbers, spell out the word dollar or percent. When using the symbols, there's no space between the numeral and symbol. Finally, remember that you shouldn't use a symbol to start a textual sentence. You can rearrange the sentence to avoid starting with a symbol, or you can spell out the words. The last rule to discuss in this podcast is Rule 7, using italics. So far, you've learned that italics may be used for case names, though not on Blue Book homeworks, of course. You can use italics under a few other circumstances as well. First, you can use italics for emphasis. Use this device sparingly, though. When overused, italics lose the rhetorical punch. Second, you should use italics for foreign words and phrases that haven't been incorporated into American usage. For purposes of this rule, most Latin phrases have been incorporated into our usage. But if a phrase is long, uncommon, or obsolete, you should italicize it. Of course, if you find yourself using such a phrase in your writing, you probably should think about deleting it rather than italicizing it, as those phrases fly in the face of our plain language principles. Also, remember that case, like case names, ids and procedural phrases are also italicized, but in the case of Blue Book homeworks, they're underlined. We have three additional uses for italics under Rule 7. You should italicize letters representing hypothetical entities, as in this example of A and B. You should also italicize lowercase l when used on its own so that the reader doesn't confuse the L for a number one. Finally, make sure you italicize equations. You've now finished Blue Book Episode 6 and are ready to start on your homework. If you have any questions, please see me or a TA.